I hope everybody had a good long weekend. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to, in a sense, repeat the class from last week, last week, Friday. And I say repeat because I'm going to go over some of the same questions again. But as you can see on the screen, it says I'm going to use a different method. I think it was Ishal who was in the class on Friday was saying that in physics, there was another way that you looked at adding these vectors together. So even though that's something we're meant to do in a couple of weeks from now, I thought, why not just go ahead and present that to everybody today so that those of you who prefer this method can use it. And, and the truth is that another reason why I'm using this second method is because if you had to do Added, adding vectors together and there were lots of vectors let's say not just two we were only doing questions that had two vectors when we did this on friday but what if you're doing three or four vectors that were all acting uh, you know at the same time and you wanted to figure out what was the resultant of those vectors that could get that diagram could get very complicated so i thought why not show them what we're calling what is what is called a component form of vector addition as I said, this is something we're going to be doing in more detail later on, but I thought let's just introduce it now since there are people in the class who have already seen this with their physics in the physics course. So let's get started. I want to take you back a bit. I'm assuming that you would have done something like this when you were in initially introduced to sine and cosine of some of the special angles. And Maybe it was presented to you the way I'm about to present it to you. I don't know. But here's how I'm going to present it to you today. Think of a unit circle. And by a unit circle, what I mean is a circle that has a, dia sorry, a radius of 1. So this ray that's going from the origin out to the edge of the circle, right? that would be the radius of the circle. And that length of that line is actually 1 unit long. So let's assume that that ray, that vector, starts off on the x-axis and is rotating in a counterclockwise direction. So when you're at zero, this thing, this vector is flat on the x-axis at one zero, meaning the tip of the vector is sitting, because the length of the vector is one unit long, the tip of this vector is at one zero, if that makes sense. So zero degrees, so you bring this vector all the way down flat on the x-axis. There is no angle between the vector and the x-axis, so it's zero degrees, that would mean that the tip would be at one zero. If I rotate that through 90 degrees, so I'm up here now, it would mean that the tip of the vector is now at zero one and so on. If I go to 180, it's now minus one zero. If I go to 270, it's zero minus one. And of course, if I go back to 360, I'm back to where I started from. So I'd have the same coordinate of one zero. So I want you to think of that vector as having an x and a y component, right? So obviously the x component is the x coordinate and the y component is the is sorry, the x comp yeah, the x component is 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 this one here, the one and the y component is the zero. I want you to think of the y component as being sine. And I say that because if you think about it, look at this triangle that I've just created right here. Right? If I took this triangle, if I dropped a, a line from here down to the x-axis and if I dropped a line along the x-axis out to the point over here, then the sine of this angle that I'm talking about rotating would be equal to this coordinate, which is my y-coordinate over 1, which would mean that the sine of this angle would just be the y-coordinate, if you think about it. And the cosine would be the x-coordinate because cosine is the adjacent side. So this side down here would be my adjacent side. So therefore, the cosine would be the x coordinate. Give me one minute, sir. Let me see if there's somebody who needs to be let in. Uh, no, looks like we're good. All right. So, 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 in every single case, wherever I am on this circle, my x coordinate is always going to be my cosine, and my y coordinate is always going to be my sine. Turns out that the tangent of this angle is actually equal to my y divided by my x. And I have this table here to illustrate exactly that. If you have your calculators close by, then you can verify this information for yourself. The sine of 0 is 0. Why? Because when the angle between here and here is 0, my sine being my y coordinate 
it is going to be zero because I'm right here at one zero. So therefore, my sine is zero. My cosine would be one. If I'm up here, then my sine would be no at if I'm now at 90 degrees, that is. My sine is now 1 because my x coordinate is now, um, is now uh, the, sorry, the x coordinate is now 0. My sine coordinate, my, my y coordinate is now 1. And you keep going around in a circle like that. And you see how the x and the y coordinates would always be your sine and your cosine. My tangent, as I said, is just the y divided by the x. And that's why the tangent of 0 is 0 because I'm taking the 0 divided by 1. And for 90, it would be 1 divided by 0, which is, of course, undefined. That's why I have the infinity symbol here. 180 would be 0 divided by minus 1. That's 0 again. And 270 would be minus 1 over 0. That's also infinity. So I know this doesn't sound like I'm talking about vectors, but you'll see the connection in a minute. I just want you to always think of sine as being your y coordinate and cosine as being your x coordinate when this length of this line or this circle has a has a radius of one. That's always going to be the case. So if I took any other point, you know, not necessarily at 90, not necessarily at 180, not necessarily at 270 or at 360, any other point, and I wanted to know what was the x coordinate and the y coordinate, just look for what the sine is, because that's your y. Look at what the cosine is, because that's your x, at any point along this circle. Okay, let me take you to my next page. Change that distance that we're using for the circle. And let's just now put a coordinate as being at 2, 3. So this is the point that I'm going to use the vector from the origin to. And this vector has this x coordinate and this y coordinate. OK, so if that's the case, I can easily come up with a distance for L by using Pythagoras, right? That sounds simple enough. I could say. In fact, let me do it this way here. I could say that the L squared using Pythagoras is equal to the 2 squared plus the 3 squared. So it's equal to the square root of 13. That's what this line is. That's what this the length of this line is. That also means that I could express my sine of the angle, this angle inside here, as being the opposite, which again is your y coordinate, over the hypotenuse, which we said was the square root of 13. So that means that this length of this line, if I just rearrange this, this, this x component here, sorry, this y component here would be equal to 13 times the sine of theta. Okay, I just, I just by rearranging that. And similarly, for my x, I could just say that the cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent side, which is 2, over the length of this line, right, which is the hypotenuse, which is the square root of 13. And if I rearrange that, I could say that my 2 is equal to 13, the length of this line, times the cosine of theta. So in every single case, I can express my x and my y. So this is my y, right? The 3, that's this length of this line here, is equal to the angle, sine of this angle, multiplied by the length of this line, right? That's what this is saying. And for the 2, which is the x component of this uh, line, of this vector, is the length of the line multiplied by the cosine of the angle that we have right here. OK, so I want you to bear that in mind for when I get to my next page. My x and my y could be defined in terms of the length of this line and the cosine of the angle measured from the x-axis, right? Always measured from the x-axis, not from the y, but from the x-axis, going in a counterclockwise direction. OK, now let me see if I can apply that to something that we did on Friday. Remember this question. Two forces were pulling an object, and it gives you the information here about the magnitude of the force that they're pulling with. One was 10 Newtons and one was 20 Newtons. And there was a direction that was given. One was pulling south and one was pulling north, 23 east. Now, I don't want to go over the question again using the method that we did on Friday. I'm just going to remind you, I'm underlining it here, that it said that the result of this was that the force, the resultant force was 11.48 Newtons and that the direction because you need both to be able to define a vector, it was north 43 east. That was the answer we got on Friday. Now, let's approach this in a different way. What if we said that, no, it's the same diagram, right? I just removed the other vectors. Well, we use it to make the parallelogram because you use the parallelogram law. But I'm still going to put that 20 Newton line and that 10 Newton line here. And there's a 23 degree angle from here to here because that's what north 23 east is going from north 
23 degrees towards the east. So I have the same diagram right here. 23 degrees in here, a 20 Newton line here, and a 10 Newton line here. But what if we decided to change the way we look at this in terms of the X and Y components of this line and this line? Now, bearing in mind what I just did a few minutes ago, this line here, right, is 20 long and it's 23 degrees away from north. So it means it would be take 23 away from 90 degrees. It would be 67 degrees away from the X axis. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm just subtracting 90, sorry, 23 from 90. OK, this other angle all the way over here, if I wanted to get from here all the way around to where this line that's going south is, that'll be 270 degrees. Right. Again, always think of it in terms of rotating from what we used to call a standard position and going in a clockwise direction, sorry, counterclockwise direction. How do I get to this position and how do I get to that position? Well, to get to this position, 23 degrees away from north, we already said that's 67 degrees. To get to this position, that's 270 degrees. So what if I decided to talk about the X component of this line, this line that was 67 degrees away from the X axis? Remember, the X component would be the length of the line, which is 20, multiplied by cosine. Cosine is my X, the cosine of 67. That would be the X component of this line right here. This line down here also has an X component. It would be the 10, which is the length of the line, multiplied by the cosine of the angle that it forms in going from zero all the way around to that 10 Newton line. So those two are X components. Now, if I'm trying to combine vectors, I could just add my X components together. That works fine. Let's get to the Y component. Well, the Y, remember, was your sine. So again, I'm going to use the same 20 but now I'm going to take the sine of 67, so the distance away from the x-axis on this side, and the same 10, but now the sine of 270, which is a distance from here to here. Now, both of these are y components. Both of these are x components. I'm just going to add them together. That's what I've done on this line. The 20 cosine 67 and the 10 cosine 270, just adding those two together. And the 20 sine 67 and the 10 sine 270, I've just added those two together. That should represent the combined X of when I added these two vectors together. Now, I've done something else which I think is important when you are doing questions like this. I also had to figure out where the resultant vector was going to be. Notice that I put a plus sign here and a plus sign here. If you took your calculator and you probably have your calculator close by, if you do, then you could work this out for yourself. Work out what this is, right? What is the numerical value of this uh, X component? When I add these two together, it turns out to be positive. We'll get to what the number actually is later on, but right now it's positive. If I took the Y components and added those two together, that's going to be positive as well. Here's what this is telling me, that the result that I'm getting is somewhere in either the, and the reason I'm saying that I, I know where this is going to end up is because I'm taking the tan now, which is the y divided by the x, we talked about that before, of the angle that we're actually going to need eventually. That's either going to be in the first quadrant or the third quadrant. All right, let me say that again. If I need to know the angle of the final result, I'm going to take the tan of the y divided by the x. And I kind of need to know where that is. And because I'm going to be dividing this number by this number, and they're both positive, that's telling me using the cast rule, I'm either going to be in the first quadrant or the third quadrant. That's important for us to know. We're going to get to that in a minute. OK, now let's get to the actual calculation. Um, so I'm going to come down. Kevin? Sorry, go ahead. Wait, sorry, can you just repeat that last part that you did? Oh, sure. Um, Sure. I think it's important for us to know if these are both positive, right? Uh, let, me, let me put it to a different way. If both the X and the Y are positive, I'm going to change what I just said, actually. If both the X and the Y are positive, yes, the angle that we're going to need is going to be either the first or the second or the third quadrant. But the truth is that both of these being positive actually tells us that it's in the first quadrant. Because if my X and my Y are both positive, can we agree that that would mean that I'm in somewhere between 0 and 90 degrees? Does that make sense? Hopefully that does. 
right? Yeah. Positive X, positive Y. Okay. So let me go from there. So I'm going to take now these two sides, which represent my new X and my new Y. And if I have my X and my Y, right, I can figure out the length of this vector by using Pythagoras, right? I'll take you back for a second to what we did over here, right? When we needed to find the length of this line, we just found this squared plus this squared and use Pythagoras. So now we're taking these new dimensions. We added the two x's together. We added two y's together. And now we have a new x and a new y, but we still need to figure out the length of the resultant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this 20 plus cosine 67 plus the 10 cosine 270, square it. And I'm going to take the 20 cosine, this all this, all, this, all this stuff here and square that. But that's my L squared. So, of course, you all know that I have to take the square root of that. And it works out to be this, 11.48 newtons. That number is the same number we had up here, 11.48 newtons. So, I got the same answer by using a different approach. Now, how about the angle? Okay, so I need to know what the angle is in quadrant one when I add these two together. And that, what is, that's why this is going to be the approach. I'm going to now take the tan of theta. I don't know what theta is yet. But I'm going to put the sum that I got over here for y, the 20 cosine 6 m plus 10, all this stuff here. And I'm going to put that over my x. That's exactly what you see me have here. Right? So tan to the, 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 the tan of the angle that I'm trying to find is this divided by that. So you know how to do this. That's going to give me 47.1. But that's 47.1 up here in this quadrant. But I need, for me to be able to give the answer for this, this is north 23E. So if I want to give an answer that's similar to that, if I'm 47 degrees going this way, right, from the x-axis, that's what the angle is. The angle that I got of 47.1 degrees is 47.1 degrees from the x-axis going this way. And I want to know how far it is from north. Shouldn't I just simply take that away from 90 degrees, which is what I've done here, and I'm getting north 43 east. Again, same answer from before, the north 43 east. But I'm now getting that by just saying, OK, the tan of the angle that I really want is the y divided by the x. And then all I'm going to do now is that angle is somewhere in quadrant 1, but it's from the x-axis. I want it from the y-axis because this kind of directional bearing has to be north from north going either east or west. Well, it's north in this quadrant, 47 degrees away from the eastern line. So it must be 43 degrees, which is what the answer is there. Okay, let's move on to the next question. Remember this one. This one was asking us to just, it didn't ask us about directional bearings. It just said two forces had different magnitudes, 7 newtons, 11 newtons. Angle between them was 135. That's all it said. Okay, again, we used the parallelogram approach. And I'm not going to go over that again. But I'm going to remind you what the answers were. The force of the combined vectors was 7.82 newtons. And it was 84.1 from F1. So this time, I don't really need a directional bearing. I just want to know how far it is from one of the existing vectors. So here's what I've done. I've taken the first one. So this diagram, I just took away these, the other vectors. So I took away this, and I took away that. I just put the two vectors tail to tail with a 135 degree angle between them. So here is the same situation here, 7 and 11. Both of them are there. And what I've done is I've taken this, and I've rotated it until this red line is now lined up with the x-axis. Okay, So there's still a 135 degree angle down here. Right, but just remember now this seven instead of just pointing up somewhere in some arbitrary direction, it doesn't need a specific bearing, it just needs to have a 30, 135 degree angle between them. But if I set that seven Newton line and line it up against the x axis, then I can now use the method that we just talked about. This would be zero degrees, right? I could just make this zero since I'm putting it right on the x axis, I can call it zero. 
I'm still going to have a 135 that takes me to the other vector because all of that is rotated this thing so that this ends up on the x-axis. But this is still 135 uh, degrees away, but it's now over here. All right, now let's think about this. My x component is my cosine. Cosine is my x. So I'm just going to use 0. It's 7 cosine of 0, right? The length of the vector multiplied by the cosine of the angle. The angle is sitting right on the x-axis. That's just the cosine of 0. Now, what about this angle down here, right? But I have to think about this. I need to measure from here all the way around to here because I have to be consistent with the way I'm referring to that angle. It's 135 going this way. What if I was taking from here and I'm going all the way around this way? Well, hopefully you can see that I'm going to take 135 away from 360 because instead of going like this, right, I'm going like this. So take away. So this is 360 going this way, right, all the way around to here. But I'm going to be 135 away from a full 360. So I'm going to take that 135 away from 360. That gives me 225. So let's go through the process again. I have the 7 cosine 0 is 0 degrees for the 7. But for the 11 Newton line, I'm now 225 degrees away measured in this direction from the x-axis. That's the 225 that takes me to the same position as this 135 away from this red line. So I'm going to do what I did before. 7 cosine 0, 11 cosine 225 on the x side. On the y side, it's 7 sine 0 and 11 sine 225. Now, the difference between the one we did before and the one that we're doing now is that some of these things actually make it easier for us. The cosine of 0 is 1. So it's just 1 times 7. So that's why I've just put 7 here. The And then plus the cosine of 11 times the cosine of 225. So this just becomes 1 times 7. And this is 7 times this. Now, on this side, this is 7 times the sine of 0. This is actually 0. The sine of 0 is 0. So that means that all I'm left with is 11 sine of 225. That's why that's all that's there. Okay, so I have this 7, which is this, when you simplify it, because the cosine of 0 is 1, plus 11 cosine 225. This is the total of my x co components right here. These two together represent my x components added together. Over here, my y component, one of them disappears to 0 because, as I said before, the sine of 0 is 0. So all that's left is 11 sine 225. And that's what my total is, just that. Turns out that both of these are negative, right? You can put that on your calculator for yourself. They're both negative. Not really that relevant on this one because really all I'm trying to get is not a direction you know, relative to north, south, east, or west. I just want to know how far I am from the 7 new line. That's really all I need. So if I can get, get what that angle is, I'm good to go. How far am I from this line right here? So let's put this together now. I'm going to take the, let's see if I have that there. I'm going to take my L squared. So the resultant vector's magnitude is going to be the 7 plus 11 cosine 225 squared plus 11 sine 225 squared. Remember, those are your totals right there. And it works out that L is 7.82 newtons. Well, look at that. If I go back, and look at my previous answer, the 7.82 newtons is right there. Same answer. I didn't use the parallelogram law, but I end up with the same magnitude. And again, I'm going to take the tan now of the Y component over the X component. So that would be the 11 sine 225 over the 7 plus 11 cosine 225. Perfect. So here's what I'm getting. I'm getting 83.4 degrees. Sorry, eight, sorry. I'm getting 84.3 de 84 degrees away from here. No, you might be thinking, well, shouldn't that be 84? It doesn't. The point is that I'm 84.3 degrees away from this. If I was even going this way, this doesn't matter. The fact is that 84.3 degrees away from this vector right here, this line right here. You might say somewhere up here. But the fact is, it is down here in this um, between them both. That's why 84.3 degrees, if I go back to the question, 84.1, huh, where is 84.3 coming from? Well, I'll, maybe I just made a mistake when I was doing it before. At any rate, there is my answer right there. So 
my answer is the same as before. Let me move on. This one. This one, again, is directional in nature, right? And you need to be aware of the fact that I'm measuring my 291 going from my from, from the north, going in a clockwise direction. That's why I'm ending up over here. I'm going to remind you of the answers we got. The 404.78 kilometers per hour, that was my speed. And it was 284.4 was the direction. Those are my answers. We use a parallelogram approach that time. But let's see what that looks like when we're not using a parallelogram approach. We're using this component approach. So here is the line, which is 420 kilometers per hour. And then the south line is down here. Now, let's think about what this angle here needs to be. Let me remind you, this is 291, but 291 measured from here around to here. So if I think of that as being, well, let, let's, let's do it this way. 291 would be here, right? One way I could do this is ask myself, how far am I from the x-axis here? Well, if you think about this, I could take 180 and and minus that to get what this how to get this angle up here. And then I could add that on to remember I'm trying to get from here to here. I could add that on to 90 to get to this angle right here. So what that works out to be, okay, for the 420 line is actually 159. It's 159 going this way, right? You can check that out for yourself. It's 291 from here to here. But from here to here, it's 159. There are a couple of ways that you can do that to verify that. Um, but you can verify that on your own. It is 159 going from here to here. right? And that's really what I'm trying to get. I'm trying to get an angle from here to here. So if I notice this from here, from here to here is 291, maybe you can take that away from uh, 360 and then see what that difference is and add that back to 90. That's one way to do it. Works out to be two, 159. This one down here is clearly 270. So that's south because I'm going all the way around here to get to here to get me 270. So we're going to do the same thing again. I'm going to take the 50, multiply it by cosine my x component. I'm trying to get my x component. The 50 times the cosine of 270, right? And I'm going to take 420 times the cosine of 159. And if anybody isn't sure how we got that 159, we can certainly stop and go over that. But that's the angle that I'm using. And I'm going to do the same thing for y, except I'm going to use sine because sine is my y component. So the same 50 and 270, but now I'm using sine. The same 420 and 150, but now I'm using sine. I'm adding these together. This turns out to be negative, and this turns out to be positive. Now, I want you to think of a grid right now where you are positive on the x-axis, but negative on the y-axis, right? Sorry, sorry, x and y. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me rephrase that. The x component is negative, so I'm on the negative side of the x-axis, but I'm on the positive side of the y-axis. So here's where I should be somewhere in this quadrant, quadrant two right here. I repeat that just to make sure because I made a mistake the first time. My x component is negative, so I'm somewhere on this side of the x-axis, and the y component is positive, so I'm somewhere up here on the x-axis. Bear that in mind when you get your angle later on. So let's see what we have at this point. I'm going to, oh, first of all, I've added these together, obviously, right? And I've added these together because that's what we do with component form. I know I'm going to find the length of the line in the same way, right? I take the 420 cosine of 159. Oh, by the way, the cosine of 270 is actually, uh, where am I at No. That should be zero. So that's zero. And therefore, this is just 420 cosine of 159. Over here, the sine of 270 is minus one. So it's just minus 50 plus 420 sine of 159. So that just sort of shortens up a little bit. So that's why this is the x component, right? Because I got rid of this, the 50 cosine 270, that just is zero. And these two things are being squared. And again, you get the answer that we got over here. All right, 404.78 is exactly the same thing we got. So there's my answer. Now I'm going to put the tan of the y, which is this, over the x, which is this. And here's what that answer looks like. 
Now, initially, I'm thinking minus 14.38. How am I going to interpret that? Well, think of that. I don't really concern myself so much with the sign. And it's, what, it's a piece of advice I'm going to give to you right now. I don't concern myself so much with the sign. I just concern myself with the angle, which is saying is 14.38. That's 14.38 away from the x-axis, always from the x-axis. And we already decided that that angle was going to be in quadrant two. So it's 14.38 away from, quadrant, from the x-axis in quadrant two. How can we convert that into a degree, an angle, measured from here all the way around to here? Remember, I'm 14.8 away from the x-axis in this quadrant right here. But I need to measure from here all the way around to Can anybody think of a way that I could do that? I could take that 14.38 degrees and end up in the third, away from the x-axis and end up in the third quadrant. Sorry, quadrant two. I said third quadrant, actually quadrant two. Can anybody think of a way that I can take that 14.38 and end up in quadrant two? Any ideas on how I could do that? Nobody has a thought on that? Just think of this eventual, the, the resultant line is 14.38 away from the x-axis in this quadrant, right? So how do I get the actual angle measured from here going in a, uh, a, a clockwise direction, 14.38 in this quadrant. Can anybody think of a way to do that? Come on, folks. Must be somebody who can give me an answer for that. Silence. You can all hear me. Come on. Yes, Andy, go. Oh, 270 plus. Yeah, okay, I can't. Uh, by the way, I, one of the reasons I switched over to the 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 um the smart board software is because i can go back and forth and see who's in the room and see the text messages this time so andy gave me an answer and he's absolutely right i can take that two cent and add on the 14.38 and that gives me 284.4 and guess what exactly what we had before so again different method you just have to be able to interpret your answers when you get your answers at the end right? You have to take your X components, add them up, your Y components, add them up, find the, 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 the magnitude by using Pythagoras. And then using tan, you can find the angle. And depending on how the angle needs to be presented, for one of the questions, we just had to know how far it was from one of the pre-existing vectors. In one case, it was some degrees away from north, east, or west or south. I mean, that was one of the ways that we had to present it. In this case, we're just trying to get a, a, a bearing going from north, a certain clockwise uh, amount of rotation away from north. And that is absolutely right, 270 plus that 14.38. And there is my answer right there. So what I'm going to do, right, because I'm actually done. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a question together. There wasn't any, this is not on the schedule. Right? There wasn't a question that had this approach to, to it on the schedule. I'm going to do one, but I'm going to do one with three vectors. Just step up the game a little bit. I'm going to do one with three vectors. And you have to find the resultant vector for three vectors acting on, on a common point. Don't draw a diagram. Don't do what we did on Friday. I want you to try this component approach and see if you can end up with what the resultant vector is. And a vector must have not just magnitude, but also direction. I'm going to put that question on teacher ease. And I'm going to be asking for, I'm going to give you all the information you need, similar to what we did here. And you know what I'm going to, I probably give you two questions. I'm going to give you one where the di direction has to be from north rotating clockwise. I'm going to put one where it's north either east or west or south, east or west, and ask you so that you can get practice with looking at both of those. I'm going to put them on teacher ease and give you some specific rounding instructions because teacher ease will mark it for you and give you instant feedback at the end as to whether they got it right or not. So that will be your homework for tonight. Instead of it being from the textbook, and I don't know whether you're actually doing those questions or not, I'm going to make one up but with three vectors just to step it up in terms of complexity. Actually, it's not really in terms of complexity. It's just in terms of the amount of steps you have to do. And ask you to try that and see how you do with that. All right? 
So that's it from me for today.